My parents came to the Lord when I was about five years of age. As you've heard me say any number of times, my dad had never seen a Bible until he was 25 years old. My mother had not either, had never heard a gospel song. I want you to think of that. But wonder of wonders, the Lord Jesus came into their heart and their life and their world, our world changed. <laughs> Glory to God. And a few weeks later, my grandmother was baptized with the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking with other tongues, the very first one in our family to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And I have in my heart a real love for the Church of God because it was at a Church of God camp meeting that my grandmother <laughs> went through to the mighty Holy Spirit. <laughs> and if our world had not changed, it did change then, gloriously and wondrously, because that's all she talked about was Jesus Christ. Made my mother and dad a little angry. We all went to the same church, but she, they said she's gotten a little fanatical, but just a few weeks time, both of them were baptized with the Holy Spirit as well. So Brother Hall, I have a love for this denomination and I uh, thank God for the millions of souls that the Church of God, one of the largest organizations in the world for Christ, has been instrumental to touch countless hearts and lives. I want you to come. This microphone is yours. I want you to feel just like you are at home because you are. Would you give the Lord in his life a hand? Praise the Lord. Thank you, Brother Swaggart. What a joy to be with all of you here today. I appreciate this opportunity to stand before you and to stand on a platform that has so significantly spread the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ around this world. Amen. When I consider the enormity and the impact of ministry that emanates from this platform and out of this sanctuary around this world, it is indescribable. Brother and Sister Swaggart, thank you so much for how God has used you. Donnie, Gabriel, what a generational anointing is upon this family. I had the opportunity to have dinner last night when I came in with Brother Swaggart and Brother Donnie and Brother Gabriel, and I told them that when I am a guest speaker anywhere, and I usually am every Sunday somewhere, I said, there are three goals that I have. Number one, I want to lift up the name of Jesus Christ. I want Jesus to be happy with what I do while I'm here today. Secondly, I want to bless the believers. I want you to be strengthened. I want you to be encouraged. And I told Brother Swaggart last night, this is my third goal. I always do my best never to preach an old Lord help me sermon. Now, let me tell you what that is. That's when the guest preacher is up preaching and the pastor who invited him is sitting behind him with his head in his hand saying, oh, Lord, help me. <laughs> I used to be a pastor and I had some guests on occasion that could do more in 20 minutes to tear down what I had done in three years. So I'm going to do my best not to do that today. I've had the privilege of traveling around this world, not unlike many of you. A lot of you have done that. In traveling in the various nations where I have been, I've also had the opportunity to see the sights that many of those nations are famous for. I'll never forget when I went to China back in the mid-90s, we visited the Great Wall of China. 
Not too many months ago, I had the opportunity to be in Berlin, Germany, and I saw the remnants of what used to be the wall that separated East and West Berlin. I've also had the opportunity to travel to California and see the Golden Gate Bridge. I've crossed the Bridge of London and many other bridges. And I've come to the conclusion with all of that that I like bridges a whole lot better than I like walls. Because when I stand at walls, about all I can do is just gaze upon them and wonder what's on the other side and what is the difference between those of us on this side and that side. But when I come to a bridge, I've yet to come to one that I was unable to take the opportunity and just cross it and enjoy what the connectivity brought into my life. Brother Swaggart, if I can just say to you, the significance of your invitation to me today speaks volumes, and it builds bridges, and I choose to cross that bridge today. Thank God. Thank God. I am so honored today to have some of the most incredibly gifted and talented singers and musicians to sing with me today. I'm kind of like that guy that said, I've had a request, but I'm going to sing anyhow. And so I'm going to sing anyhow today. Would you help me today? Here's a song that I hope you heard somewhere. And if you did, I hope it blessed you. If you've never heard it before, I hope it'll speak to you today. It tells the story of Job, how he lost everything that he had except his trust and his faith in God. And the Bible said that his latter end was greater than his beginning. And in all of this, Job sinned not, neither did he charge God foolishly. They had said to Job, why don't you curse God and die? Forget it. Drop this integrity thing. But Job lived with this attitude, if I can curse God and die, I can bless God and live. Let's sing the song. What have you done to deserve all this? Curse God and die. What advice for a man who had trusted God most of his life? But then Job speaks as he stands among his broken down domain in the midst of it all i shall stand and not fall and bless his name in the midst of it all in the midst of it all
should the day ever come when everyone bows their heads to cry and when man has done all that man can do and I'm left alone to die well even then when I'm surrounded by affliction's greatest pain in the midst of it all I shall stand and not fall and bless his name in the midst of it It's a hope in Christ Jesus that not one time has ever let me fall. shakes his head and walks away there is one who said i'll never leave you and i'll never forsake you but i'll be with you always even till the end of the world he can be counted on he can be depended on i tell you what i feel the holy ghost in this house this morning should the day ever come when everyone bows their heads to cry and when man has done the very last thing that man can do and I'm left alone to die ah but even then when I'm surrounded by afflictions greatest pain in the midst of it all I shall stand and not fall and bless his name in the midst of it all
once again. Give him praise once again. Hallelujah. Well, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Glory to God. Hallelujah. Sing that chorus again. He of it all. feel him here. I was in one of those old-fashioned testimony services one night. This individual jumped up and said, I have something to say. I said, say it. She said, you can count on God. I said, that's right. She said, you can count on him nine times out of ten. I said, let's talk about that right there. You can count on him every time. 10 out of 10, 100 out of 100, 1,000 out of 1,000. Well, I'm trying hard to behave myself up here. That's right. You know, I don't know if any of you have ever been on this stage right down here or not, but there's a trap door right there in the middle. Robin, I noticed that when I walked down there this morning. I, I dare not go down there while I'm preaching today. I've got a feeling there's a button somewhere right over there. <laughs> well, I feel right at home today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. <laughs> Brother Swagger has already mentioned so many guests that are here today, and I won't do that again, obviously, but I do want to thank our state administrative bishop, Brother and Sister Melvin and Glenda Schuler for being here today. They give great leadership to the Church of God in Louisiana. So glad they're here. And my wife Paula is with me today. Next week we celebrate 39 years of marriage, and I'm glad that she's here. I come today with a fresh passion in my spirit about the spirit-empowered life, about what it really means to be a Pentecostal in the world today. If I can just simply say this and move on, I will tell you that in some circles, Pentecost is not a very important word. 
In some circles, it is a disdained word. But to those of us who understand what Pentecost means and what it means to walk in the Spirit-empowered life, it is an embraced word. Because when you comprehend and understand the depth of what it means to be a Pentecostal, then you understand that being filled with the Holy Spirit is much, so much more than just for your enjoyment. It's for our employment. I was not filled with the baptism of the Holy Spirit so that I could sing faster songs, get exuberant necessarily in my worship and run the aisles, clap my hands more vigorously or jump higher. We all enjoy that at times when it happens, but I was filled with the Holy Spirit so that I might fulfill what Jesus said in Acts 1 and 8. Ye shall be filled with the power of the Holy Ghost, and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of of the earth. We have been filled with the Holy Spirit so that we might fulfill the Great Commission. You see, I happen to believe that when Jesus gave the Great Commission in Matthew 28, he did so first out of divine authority. He said, all power in heaven and earth is given unto me. And flowing out of that divine authority, he gave a very deliberate assignment when he said, go and do all the world and make disciples. And the implication there is that we make disciples who make disciples who make disciples. And then he gave a very dependable assurance when he said, when you do this, and if you do this, as you do this, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. I believe that when Jesus gave the Great Commission, he fully intended that that would be finished someday. Now, evangelism will always happen until Jesus comes. There will always be someone to tell about Jesus. But I really believe that when Jesus gave the Great Commission, he had in mind that there would be a great completion as well. In the church of God, most recently, we've been talking about playing our role in finishing the Great Commission. We talk about the word finish. We talk about finding the unreached. Whoever they are, wherever they are, around the world or across the street or under your own rooftop, find the unreached and win them to Jesus. Then we talk about interceding in prayer. This doesn't happen without intercession. Then we talk about networking together. And may I tell you that if we're not networking, we're not working. We've got to find ways to do this together. And then we talk about investing. Investing in people, investing in planting churches, investing in reaping this harvest. Then we talk about sending world missions. Helping to send missionaries around this world and to raise up Bible schools and to help orphanages. Do whatever we can to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then we talk about the harvest. And I could take up all of my time here today talking to you about why I believe that we are the generation. Regardless of what denomination, regardless of what name is over the door, we are the generation, I believe, that could see the completion of of the Great Commission. There's a lot of reasons that I won't go into today. But I could talk to you about the advance of technology. That's one reason. I could talk to you, Brother Gabriel, about the incredible student movement that is going on around this world and young people that are willing to lay down their lives for the cause of the Lord Jesus Christ. I could talk, talk to you about the fact that the mission field has now become a mission force. The United States of America is no longer the primary sender of missionaries. 
but they're going from literally around the world to the rest of the world. But the primary reason that I believe that we can fulfill the Great Commission is because we have been endued with power from on high for that purpose. You shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And we talk about Pentecost simply to identify the fact that on the day of Pentecost, 50 days after the Passover, was when God in his sovereignty and his omniscience decided that this is the time, Jerusalem will be the place that I will pour out of my spirit. And from there, it will go around the world. I want to take just a few minutes today, and I don't need very long, but I, I want to talk to you just simply about Pentecost. Can I talk first of all about the setting of Pentecost? Jesus said to his disciples and to his followers, do not leave Jerusalem, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. Now, I must admit to you, that had I been Jesus, I don't know that I would have sent them to Jerusalem. And it beggars the question, why Jerusalem of all places? He could have easily sent them to Bethany. He had a good thing going on in Bethany. He had raised Lazarus from the dead in Bethany. He had the nucleus of a good church plant already going in Bethany. There was Lazarus and Mary and Martha. And everybody knew what he had done when he called Lazarus from the grave and said, Lazarus, come forth. And they loosed him from his grave clothes and he was set free to live again. He could have easily gone to Bethany, but he said, go to Jerusalem. Possibly I would have sent them to Cana of Galilee. And Cana of Galilee is where he performed his first public miracle. And he attended this wedding. And shortly they ran out of wine and his mother came to him requesting a miracle. And at the end of the feast, after he had turned water into wine, the governor of the feast declared, you have saved the best for the last. So why not go to a place where my reputation is already established as a miracle worker. Maybe I can get a good start in Cana of Galilee or Bethany or any other place where he had been to raise the dead or heal the sick or walk on the water. But he emphatically said to his followers, we're going to Jerusalem. Why, Jesus, are you going to send this group of disciples to Jerusalem. First of all, it was prophetic. In Isaiah chapter 2, verse 3, the prophecy had already been given that we shall return to Zion. And from Jerusalem, the word of the Lord will go forth. It had a prophetic reason. But he also sent them to Jerusalem because it had a very practical reason. He understood that in the will of God, when the Spirit came, it would come on the day of Pentecost. And thousands upon thousands of people would be there on that day. And when the Spirit of God would be poured out in the upper room, there would be men and women in Jerusalem from most every known area of the world. Multiple languages would be represented in Jerusalem that day. And the prophetic, practical, pragmatic mind of an awesome, almighty God, he said, we're going to pour out my spirit in Jerusalem so that when it comes, it will not just be contained in Jerusalem, but it will spread out to the known world. And they took it back to Mesopotamia. They took it back to Cappadocia. They took it back to all over those places. And literally the world became infected, if you will, by the power of the Holy Spirit because it came to Jerusalem. <laughs> but it wasn't just prophetic. And it wasn't just practical. It was personal. Jerusalem had been the place of crucifixion. Jerusalem had been the place of betrayal. 
Jerusalem had been the place of denial. But Jerusalem was also the place that Jesus loved. He sat in a high place one day and he looked over the city and the Bible tells us that he wept over Jerusalem. And he cried and he said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how oft I would have gathered you unto myself as a mother hen gathers her brood, but you would not. Jesus had a personal love and investment in Jerusalem. And he was not about to let the devil run him out of town. And I feel like preaching now. He had faced persecution. He had faced all of these things, but he knew that there was an investment that was coming from God Almighty to the city of Jerusalem. And so he sent these believers back to Jerusalem. And the Bible said when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were there in Jerusalem in one mind, in one accord. And suddenly, you know what I prayed before I came over here this morning that a suddenly would happen in Baton Rouge. I came by to tell somebody Jesus has this city in mind just as much as he loved Jerusalem. Jerusalem. He loves your city. He loves Baton Rouge. He loves this state. And I'm praying that a suddenly a Kairos moment of the Holy Ghost will come to this city today. Let's not just talk about the setting of Pentecost. Let's talk about the sounds of Pentecost. There came a sound from heaven in Acts chapter 2. When that day had fully come, there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. Can we talk about the source of that sound? It came from heaven. It originated in the throne room of God himself. Can I tell you, we need a sound from heaven. Somebody better pray for me. I got preach on me right now. I don't mean to be critical of any place, anybody, anywhere, but I want to tell you, I really don't need another sound from Washington, D.C. I really don't need another sound from Wall Street and New York City and all the convulsions that they're always in. I don't really need another sound from any particular place. I need to hear a sound that originates in the throne room of God. I want to know and I want to hear what God is saying to the church today. My God, I feel the Holy Ghost in this house. We need a sound from the glory world. We need a sound that transcends race. We need a sound that transcends culture. We need a sound that transcends denominations. We need a sound that gets over the hurdles and over the mountains and over the walls that I was talking about. We need to hear, we need to hear a sound from the glory world today. Let's not just talk about the source of it. Let's talk about the strength of it. The Bible said it came as a rushing, mighty wind. The word rushing comes from the word that we get the word echo from. And it speaks of the reverberation. It speaks of the magnitude. The word mighty comes from a word that indicates the downward force and the downward thrust. And God chose Jerusalem, the center of the known world, to also be the epicenter of a spiritual earthquake that was going to come and shake the world. It was a rushing mighty wind, a violent storm-like wind that came with hurricane force and tornadic force, if you will. Can I tell you, there's still strength in the power of the Holy Spirit today. I don't know what you're dealing with. I don't know what you're facing, but there's strength in the wind that is blowing today. Oh, but can I also talk to you about the saturation of that sound? The Bible said it filled all the house where they were sitting. There was not one corner left untouched. There was not one place left undone. And when I was praying early this morning, I said, oh God, saturate that beautiful auditorium today with the sound of Pentecost, with the sound of the Holy Ghost. I pray that it gets in the balcony. I pray that it gets back there in the corner where you are. I pray that it gets on this platform as a matter of in fact, I came by to remind somebody that he's God on the platform. He's God back at the door. He's God in the amen corner. And he's God all over this floor. We need to hear the sound of Pentecost that saturates the church one more time. Somebody pardon me while I shout just a minute on a Sunday morning. I feel the Holy Ghost in this house.
Listen to me. I'm not ashamed of that sound. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ because it is the power of God under the salvation of souls of men and women. Just lean over and touch somebody and tell them he's preaching all over you this morning. Let's not just consider the setting of Pentecost or the sounds of Pentecost. Let's talk about the sights of Pentecost. Acts chapter 2, there came a sound from heaven, but there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it set upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. Oh, God, let an each and an all experience happen here today. Let it set on each of us. And may we walk away from here saying we were all filled with the Holy Ghost. The sights of Pentecost. Pentecost not only came with that manifestation of the sound of the rushing mighty wind. But it came with the manifestation of the sight of tongues of fire, divided tongues, flickering flames setting upon each of them. Can I tell you, we need an obvious Pentecost again. That's worth tweeting right there. Tell them I said so. I got a meddling spirit on me here. Sometimes I meddle when I preach and my wife gets nervous when I start doing that. I want to tell you something today and there's no telling how many multiple thousands of Church of God folks are watching me preach right now. I've been getting texts and emails all morning from Church of God folks. I hope they're in a Church of God church somewhere right now paying their tithes, amen. They can watch this on the rerun. But I want to tell you and I want to tell anyone watching today, we've got too much clandestine Pentecost going on. We've got too many folks acting like Nicodemus when it comes to Pentecost. They slip in by night undercover because they don't want to be seen. And we've got some churches right now in Pentecostal movements that if you were to put them on trial for being a Pentecostal church, the judge would say, not guilty. Oh, I know somebody sitting out there thinking, what what he get a hold of today? It's not that, something's got a hold of me. I, I, I'm burning with a, a desire for God to move in Pentecost again, to touch the church, the church of God, the assembly of God, the Pentecostal wholeness, the interdenominational, it that waves a Holy Spirit Pentecostal flag. I want God to touch us again and we need to be obvious about it. I wonder sometimes if we become ashamed of our heritage. But we need the signs of Pentecost. Now understand, I'm not talking about some flaky thing. I'm not talking about goofiness. But the Bible tells us in Mark chapter 16, these signs shall follow them that believe. They shall cast out devils in the name of the Lord. They shall speak with tongues and they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not harm them. I'm telling you, it's time that we get back to real Pentecost with the blind see and the deaf hear and the lame walk and the drug addicts are set free and the alcoholics are set free. We need the obvious Pentecost to come back again. It was an obvious Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 with the fire and the wind. It was an obvious Pentecost in Acts chapter 3 when Peter and John raised the man at the gate beautiful. It was an obvious Pentecost in Acts chapter 4 when the people got back together again and the Bible said the house where they were sitting was shaken by the power and the glory of God. I'm tired of clandestine Pentecost. I'm ready for the Holy Ghost to make himself known and obvious in the church one more.
more time. Would somebody praise him in this house? You don't want me to preach. You don't want me to pray. I feel the Holy Ghost in this place. I had the occasion two weeks ago to preach the commencement exercises of what we call in the church of God our ministerial internship program. It's where young couples have given themselves to study in ministry very intensely with a supervising pastor for about a year. It's just the beginning of a more lengthier process for them. But after about a year, we bring them to Cleveland, Tennessee, and we commission them. Many of them plant churches, and they pastor churches, and they go into other vocational ministries. I was preaching my second year in a row to preach that event. And I will tell you that I thought after the first year, they won't invite me back. Doesn't matter I'm general overseer. They, they won't invite me back. Because the year before I got up and I made a bold statement. And I've got hundreds of young couples sitting out in front of me. I've got their supervising pastors. I've got professors from our seminary and our university. And long before I said this, I'd done lost every sense of dignified decorum I ever hoped I could have. <laughs> and here's what I said, Pentecost, put up or shut up. Bill Bailey, I said it then, and I'm going to say it today. Pentecost. Now, listen, I'm not talking about style. Strap a guitar over your neck, put on sandals, and sit on a stool and sing your songs. I, I'm not talking about style. But I am talking about content. I'm telling you, when you get behind the sacred desk and you have the badge of Pentecost over your spirit and over your head, my God, put up or shut up. We've got too many broken homes at stake. We've got too many husbands at stake. We've got too many wives at stake. We've got too many sons and daughters at stake. And when they walk into our sanctuaries, they come in looking for the fire of the Holy Ghost. My God, I call on every pastor, Pentecost, put up or shut up. My God, if we're going to wave the flag, let's have something in the store. If we're going to advertise it, let's have something in the shop when they get there. Somebody praise him in this house. Listen to me. We need to get back to the demonstration of the Holy Spirit. We need to get back to the distinctives of the Holy Spirit. And we need to get back to the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. In that same exercise, I got to talking about the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. Let, let, let me tell you what the foundational outflow of the doctrine of the Holy Spirit is. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. John said, I, I tell you what, I feel this all over me today. John said, I indeed baptize with water under repentance. But there comes one after me who's mightier than I, whose shoes I'm not worthy to bear. When he comes, he will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Jesus said, when the spirit of truth shall come, that this world cannot receive. But when he comes, he won't be speaking of himself. He's not going to go around beating his own drum and tooting his own horn. He's going to speak of me. I was sitting in the hotel not long ago in Greenville, South Carolina, getting ready to preach in a service that night. And I was just going through the word of God, thinking about what I might speak on. And it just hit me. Go to the book of Acts and read about that experience with Simon Peter going to the house of Cornelius. When Peter went into the house of Cornelius... And he would report this to the church later in Jerusalem. 
after just a very few minutes, as he would say to the Jerusalem church, he said, as I began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them as on us in the beginning. It hit me in that hotel room if I can find out what he preached and just start preaching it, maybe the same effect will happen for me that happened for him. I began to thumb through those pages and I found that old story and I came to the conclusion, Brother Swagger, this is what he preached. He preached Jesus born of a virgin. He preached Jesus living a virtuous life. He preached Jesus dying a vicarious or a substitutionary death. And I believe he went on and preached Jesus rising in a victorious return. And he preached Jesus coming back in visible glory. I came by to tell you when that hit me that day, I said to myself, I'm going to preach that tonight. I got up there and I preached it. Jesus, born of a virgin. Jesus, living a virtuous life. Jesus rising in a victorious resurrection. Jesus coming back in a visible return. And I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit kissed the earth that night. And people were baptized in the Holy Ghost and spake with tongues as the Spirit gave the utterance. Now, here's what happened. I finished preaching. I was exhausted. I was depleted. And I was on my way out the hallway when a young preacher boy stopped me. He had several things he wanted to ask me and tell me. Tell me more than ask me. First thing he said was, what camp are you in? I said, I'm sorry, I don't understand camp. He said, yeah, what camp are you in? And then he started listing all these famous preachers and the different things they preached. He said, are you in the wisdom camp? Are you in the prosperity camp? Are you in the get your stuff back camp? I, oh, I get it now. I get it. I said, actually, I'm in two camps. He said, you are? I said, yeah. I said, first of all, I'm in the glad I don't got to go to hell camp. I want to tell somebody I've been saved. I've been washed. My sins are under the blood of Jesus Christ. My name is written down in the Lamb's book of life and the journey gets sweeter every day. And I said, that's not all. I'm in the Holy Ghost camp. I want to tell you, young man, I've been spirit filled with the power of an almighty God. The power of the Holy Ghost operates in my life. I came by to tell somebody in Baton Rouge today, I'm not ashamed of the Holy Ghost camp. Hallelujah. <laughs> then he had enough nerve to say, well, I guess that preach is good in the South. By then, I had either gained a new anointing or lost every ounce of it I had. I'm not sure what happened. But I said, I want to tell you something, son. You better believe it preaches good in the south. But it preaches good in the west. It preaches good in the east. And it preaches good in the north. And it preaches good around the world. I came by to tell you where people are hungry. They're hungry for a move of God and the power of the Holy Ghost of God. And I'm ready for the signs of Pentecost to us again would you raise your hands and praise God in this house give him a wave offer to praise right now oh I feel that wind blowing here I, I sense I sense the fresh wind of the Holy Spirit blowing just raise your hands and give him praise, somebody. Give him praise, somebody. There came a sound from heaven. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them. It was a demonstration of Pentecost that got my father's attention. When he was in his mid-twenties setting in an auditorium in a West Texas high school, my mother, who had just recently been saved and filled with the Spirit, 
begged him, pleaded with him, go with me to this revival. And he went with her and he was sitting there and he watched two children. And he knew the family. He knew their parents. These children were critically ill. But the evangelist, whoever it was, laid hands on that brother and that sister. And my father saw a demonstration of the Holy Spirit right before his eyes. A young man who had struggled with issues in his life and even on his way to being a stumbling, bumbling alcoholic. But he sat there that night and he said to my mother, if God will do that, he'll change me. Oh God, we need to see Pentecost again. But let's not only consider the source and the sound and the sights, but very quickly, let me just mention to you the speech of Pentecost. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost and they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them the utterance. The Spirit enabled them. The Spirit gave them the ability to speak in tongues. And I want to tell you today, if there's anything that's under fire in some of our Pentecostal churches today, it's speaking in tongues. Now listen to me. I understand I'm on trial here today, not by you. But there are people watching me right now that will try me for what I'm about to say. Even in Pentecostal circles. But they have quenched the moving of the Spirit. They have attempted to douse the flame of Pentecost and not allow for the manifestation of the gifts of the Spirit in their churches anymore. But I'm going to stand here and tell you today that you're looking at a preacher that still believes speaking with tongues is the initial evidence of a Spirit-filled life. I understand, I understand there are other evidences. The gifts of the Spirit, the fruits of the Spirit, all of these things we could talk about today. But I'm telling you, I believe a Spirit-filled believer will speak in a heavenly language. And when you do, the Scripture says you're speaking mysteries unto God. I understand about all things being in order. And Paul gave beautiful, wonderful teaching about all of that in his writings to the Corinthians. And I want to tell you today, when we speak in that heavenly language, it is known to the Father. As we manifest that in moanings and groanings and utterances that we cannot decipher. But it is a language that has made its direct path to the throne room of God. And the Holy Spirit prays through us and intercession is made and deliverance comes and it cannot be intercepted by the enemy. I challenge you to pray in the Spirit. Put on the whole armor of God. My Lord, does anybody feel the Holy Ghost in this house? The helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness. Your loins girt about with truth. Your shoes shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Hiding behind the shield of faith and for a sword, the sword of the spirit. But pray always with all prayer and supplications in the Holy Ghost. There's a speech to Pentecost. I've got to stop. But I'll never forget the day I walked into a living room where a family in my church that I used to pastor in Virginia had set up a hospital bed for a precious saint of God 
to spend her last days in hospice care. She had been stricken with that sickness of Alzheimer's. She could not call her own husband by his name or any of her children. But as death was approaching, hallelujah, and her pastor and her family gathered around her bedside to sing and to pray her into the glory world. Within the last 30 minutes of her life, that little lady by the name of Frances Willis had clarity of thought, clarity of mind that only could come from the Holy Spirit. She didn't speak in English, but she began to sing in tongues to the tune of amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. And when the refrains of that heavenly language and that tune and that song had wafted away, in just a few moments, she found her way into the presence of the Lord. There's a speech. There's a speech to Pentecost. But let me end by saying this. What is the significance of Pentecost? Again, it's not so that we can just merely enjoy a thrill or the exuberance of this encounter or this experience. But it's so that God can use us as empowered witnesses to tell this world about Jesus. The Father's heart beats for lost people. The Son's heart beats for lost people. Some years ago, I told this in our world mission service at our general convention. It's a true story. And I'll make it very brief. A young athlete who worked as a stuntman for a studio in Hollywood climbed a ladder on a train sitting perfectly still on a track. He had done all kinds of stunts in his life, in his profession, unbelievable stunts. But on this particular day, when he got to the top rung of this ladder, attached to a train sitting perfectly still on the track, he lost his footing. And he slipped back and he would die in a fatal fall. He was an organ donor. And when they determined that he could not live they did what was known as harvesting the organs of his body so that someone else could have quality of life. The story goes that his heart was given to a much older man, 30 years older than this young athlete. This particular man had been kept alive by an artificial heart for 59 days when he received news that he could have the heart of this young athlete. They went through all the procedures, all the process, the surgery was done. Days and weeks and months went by. And when a proper amount of time had gone by, however this is done, I'm not sure, but permission was granted that the recipient of this heart 
would be permitted to meet the family of the donor. They arranged for a common meeting place. And this man who had received the heart wanted to respect the family, so he got there much earlier than any of them would arrive to make sure he didn't miss them. Soon they all came into the parking area, and one by one they filed out of the automobile. He met siblings. He met the widow of the young man. He met the young man's mother. But the last to come in the door was the father of this youngster. And this man watched this father as he walked across the parking lot and into the door, and he noticed that he was holding something in his hand, and it was a doctor's stethoscope. And he knew what was about to happen. And when the father of this young athlete finally got face to face with the recipient of his son's heart, he said to this man, when I learned that I could meet you today, I went to a medical supply store and I bought this stethoscope hoping that you will let me do one thing. And even as he was speaking, he was putting the earpieces to his ears. And he reached for the amplifier of that stethoscope and he moved toward that man's chest. And he said, I was just hoping that you would permit me to put this against your chest today because one more time I just want to hear the heartbeat of my boy. And when I heard that story in preparation for that world mission service, it came to me so vividly. What if God reached over the balconies of heaven today and put some kind of heavenly celestial stethoscope against the body of Christ, what would he hear? Would he hear the heartbeat of his son for lost people? Would he hear the heartbeat of his son for Angola? For China? For all of Latin America? Would he hear the heartbeat of his son for that part of town that some people are not willing to go to anymore? I believe if the father would reach down here today to Family Worship Center, he would hear the cadence of a harvest heartbeat that says we must be empowered by the Holy Spirit to reach the world for Jesus Christ. That, my friend, is the significance of Pentecost. Would you stand with me, please, in this house? Just lift your hands and prepare a place for the Lord to dwell in your spirit right now. Father, I just welcome your Holy Spirit now. I welcome your presence here now. Come, Holy Spirit, I need thee. Come, Holy Spirit, I welcome thee. Father, may every Pentecostal movement in this world today have a fresh burden for the harvest for lost people, for sons and for daughters. Heal the nations, Lord. Heal the division among the races. Bring unity to the church and to the body of Christ. 
Help us be willing, Father, to join hands and lock arms and cross bridges that are built instead of staring at walls that divide. Oh, I feel the Holy Spirit in this room right now. I have watched your pastor just about all of my adult life give invitations all over this world for people to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Multitudes have been filled with the Holy Ghost through those invitations and the preaching about the Holy Spirit that he has done. Precious Pentecostal churches all over this world and denominational leaders today are hungry for a fresh wind of the Spirit to blow. And I cry, oh God, let it come again. Let it come again. <laughs> and the altar call that I feel impressed to give is that if there's anybody hungry, if there's anybody that's thirsty, not only here today, but watching around this world through global television ministry of Sunlight Broadcasting Network, I want you to begin to lift your hands right now. And those of you in this room, I wish you would just walk toward this stage and let's bring our hunger to God and ask him to fill us again with the oh, Holy Spirit. Oh, come. Oh, There's one filling, but there are many refillings. I need and I'm asking for a refilling of the Holy Spirit today. Oh, come. Any of you watching oh, by television right now, right there where you are, in the living room, a hotel room, I ask you to just lift your hands and say, Father, fill me with the Holy Ghost. The Bible said that if we being of this earth know how to give, give, give good gifts to our children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Ghost to those that ask him? You can be filled with the Holy Spirit today. All over this building, lift your hands and receive the touch of the Holy Spirit on your life. Sing it, sing it now. Glorious God, Holy Spirit, Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. in this place. Let him touch you. Let him touch you right there where you are. You can be filled with the Holy Spirit. Receive the Holy Spirit. Paul laid hands on the disciples of John and said, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And the Bible said he laid hands on them. He prayed for them and they received the Holy Spirit and they spake with tongues. I encourage you today to let that gift of that heavenly language just begin to flow from you as the Holy Spirit indwells you right now. In the name of Jesus. Sing it again, Brother Robin. Sing it again. Sing it again. Father, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name.
all over this house, would you raise both hands? <laughs> and would you just say, Holy Spirit, flow through me again. Say it again, Holy Spirit, flow through me again. And whomever I touch just now, may your spirit touch them in a fresh way. Now would you reach that hand over and just touch someone on their shoulder there, Father? Touch Brother Donnie today with a fresh impartation of the Holy Spirit, a refreshing of your anointing. Lay your hand on the vision and the visionaries of this house. Father, may fresh oil be poured out and may that wind blow. Father, I pray for Pentecost all over this world. I pray for every denominational leader. Make us one, Lord. Make us one. I pray for every missionary, regardless of the flag that we wave or the banner that we work under. Make us one so that we can win this world for the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, bring a revival to every known spiritual and Pentecostal movement today. God, bring a revival even to those, Lord, that would not claim to be Pentecostal. Yet, God, we find ourselves working together in the same harvest. May we lock arms even as one to fulfill the great commission in harmony as brothers and sisters in Christ. I must not belabor my time here, but I want to tell you there is a, there is a presence of the Holy Spirit here. Let's savor this moment, savor this moment of what the Lord may be doing in the body of Christ around this world. I have no idea who I'm talking to, but somewhere around this world, there's a missionary. There is an indigenous pastor in some nation, some country that needs a fresh touch of the Holy Spirit to remind you that you're on the right track and you're doing the right thing and the hand of the Lord is upon you. Move in the power of the Holy Spirit and let God finish his work through you. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise him together. Come, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Me. Sing that. Sing that with Brother Swagger today. Hallelujah. Come on, sing it with us. Those of you watching, those of you listening, you've not experienced Pentecost in your life and you want to be filled. You in the audience, if you haven't been filled with the mighty infilling of the Holy Spirit, we're fixing to pray for you. We're going to ask right where you are, whether in the sanctuary, where by television, radio, internet, by Facebook Live, we're going to ask the Holy Spirit to be poured out right where you are. Those of you in the audience, 
that you have not received, I want you to lift your hands. Just lift your hands. People that are filled, look around and see these. I'm going to pray and I'm going to ask the Holy, the Lord Jesus, who's the baptizer. I'm going to ask him to pour out his spirit upon you. I'm going to ask him to pour out his spirit right where you are in your home. And when I get through praying, we're going to lay hands on you, speak it in other tongues. When we lay hands on you, I want you to pray this prayer in English or whatever language you speak. I just want you to say, Father, in the name of Jesus, by faith, I receive the infilling of the Holy Spirit. And the moment you utter that phrase, you'll begin to sense words and language flowing deep within. That's the Holy Spirit. And here's where faith comes in. Open your mouth. Yield your tongue and begin to speak what you sense and what you feel. Now lift those hands. Those of you that came to receive that need to be, get ready to lay hands on them. Father, we come before you in the name of your son, Jesus. Thank you for Pentecost. Thank you for the Holy Spirit. We need another Pentecost. We need another Azusa Street. We need another outpouring. There are people here this morning and those watching and those listening all around the world that want Pentecost. And I'm asking right now in the name of Jesus that you would pour your spirit about on them right now. And we say it by faith. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now lay hands on them right now. Lay hands on them right now. That's it right there. You just got baptized. That's it right there. Hallelujah. That's it. You just got filled. Hallelujah. Stammering lips and other tongues. Yeah, In this house, we want to bless Bishop Hill. Didn't you enjoy the word this yes, morning? Yes, yes, I said, didn't you enjoy the word this morning? We want to bless him.